Okay, so we're recording and over to you, Paul. Okay. I'll mute everybody except for Paul so that there's no background noise. Thank you, Rakesh. Go for it. Thank you, everyone. Let me just try to share my screen because I, I have been uh, making a presentation. Uh, so, do you see the screen? Yes. All right, great. All right, sorry. Um, so yeah, resilience from a cyberpunk uh, perspective. So I'll be talking about the uh, technology. Um, and I'll be talking about why I talk about the technology in a permaculture meeting, and then what internet and communication technology is, and then talk about uh, what uh, we have as individuals or communities have as options on of resilience on a low level, uh, low level or a high level. Um, of course, I mean, in our situation here in the Western world, uh, we are still very priv privileged that uh, we have access to things like Zoom and uh, the internet uh, with this kind of bandwidth that, that we have. Um, so, so maybe this is not directly relevant for you, but I just want to present an overview of things that I have uh, that I found. My work has been, uh, I'm primarily interested in the global south and permaculture in the global south and Asia and uh, Africa. So in, in those areas, this might make more sense. So with this said, I'll make a small overview. Basically, uh, I, I view uh, the role of taking back our resilience in internet and communication in the same way that I view our role in permaculture in growing food for ourselves instead of uh, relying on Monsanto or someone to bring out this uh, perfect plant. Uh, in that same way, I don't want to rely on big corporations to handle um, yeah, our communication. Um, I put some links to where you can download your Google data, where you can download your Facebook data. You don't have to, it's just there. And yeah, the cypherpunk manifesto where the origin of cypherpunk movement started. I don't want to go into that, but uh, it's just also there for, for reference. And all of this uh, slide will be available later. So internet and communication technology. This, this slide is a bit uh, complicated, but what I just want to, to point your focus on is on the bottom of the picture we have on the physical layer um, that regards all the cabling, all the wiring, all the wireless hotspots uh, and uh, whatever constitutes our, our infrastructure today. Um, you all, I think you all are aware of the yeah, ongoing uh, technology that is happening in this space. Uh, on a high level, we have the websites, we have Facebook, we have Zoom, we have the, any app that we have on our mobile phone that, that constitutes kind of the high level of the internet infrastructure. Um, so like on the, on the low level, we have different, this is maybe more uh, targeted towards communities, larger communities of um, people of 100 or, or more who want to come together to create their own, their own uh, infrastructure. And those examples that I've listed, Rizomatica, that's a project in South America or Central America uh, where farmers on the countryside just don't have uh, access to, to phone service because the phone providers don't want to, to use the, to invest in the countryside. So for that reason, the community have had to create their own uh, phone and uh, yeah, phone and telecommunication system. And Rizomandica is, is the fruit of that. Then we have Freifunk, which is the project in in Germany, um, 
what they've made is free internet for many people in many, many parts of Germany. They, people have, the citizens have free internet, free and secure internet. Uh, Freifunk puts everything over uh, VPN and um, in, in the Western world, in Denmark, where I'm located now, uh, one of the main arguments against sharing your internet is that uh, then someone else will do it for something illegal and then you will get, get uh, uh, fined for it. But in Freifunk, they made a solution that completely circumvents that risk. And there are other projects in New York and uh, then the other links are for, for uh, associations that are working for improving the internet infrastructure in developing worlds. Uh, as I said, it might not be interesting for, for us right now, but this is just links if uh, you're interested. Then we have the resilience on the, on the high level. Um, High level layer, and that's that, that's more targeted to individuals, you and me, what we can do uh, if we want to to take back our ownership of how we go about on the internet. So I've listed some different projects here. Siphon, uh, the first one is a VPN service developed by the University of Toronto. Uh, and is, it might not be the, the best, but uh, it's the best that I could find. And what I've been reading about it is that when there's been this internet shutdown in Iran, uh, Siphon has been one of those projects that have enabled people in Iran to, to actually access to the internet, uh, despite the government trying to shut down the internet. Then just this morning, I found the project uh, Jitsi Riot, which is actually an open source version of, uh, of Zoom, uh, where you can also adjust the, the bandwidth of the video, uh, video stream so that people with low access or no, or low, low bandwidth internet will also be able to, to join in on the video conferencing. And that, that's extremely powerful. I haven't tried it yet, but I just found it extremely powerful. Um, the rest is uh, some links, uh, alternatives to Twitter, alternatives to Facebook, and uh, a browser that uh, keeps your, your privacy and blocks all apps. So I will make this presentation available in the WhatsApp group and on Facebook uh, with some extra links, and uh, hopefully that will be useful. And um, that's it for my presentation. I'm open for questions. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, so, any questions? So, I, I am interested in how this free funk makes um, makes it so that when people utilize their services, that people aren't doing anything illegally. How how do they circumvent that? I mean, maybe that's not so interesting for others, but. Uh, if you can just give like a 30 second reply to that and then maybe we can talk about it in more depth later. Yeah, they, they do it uh, because everything that everyone who connects to Freifunk is connected to a VPN. Um, so so that in that way, that's, that's kind of just what, how I understand it at, at this moment. So it's not that they're not doing anything illegally, but because you're going through a VPN, it's not traceable. Yeah. 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 Okay. So they can still do things illegally, uh, but it's just not visible. Yes. Okay. That's how I understand it. Yeah, that, that makes sense because otherwise I couldn't see how it makes sense otherwise. Otherwise, now you're policing stuff. Okay. Um, wonderful. So any other questions about that in particular? And otherwise, if not, then we'll move on to just any generic questions. So any questions about to the poor? Um, I, I just have to share, uh, I can share uh, experience with Jitsi because we use it in an association here. Um, and it's quite stable when you have enough performance. So if the server is tough enough, 
and it's uh, quite nice. And you can set it up on your own uh, server. So you have your own video conferencing environment and it's totally open. So that the cool thing is you just enter the URL of the server slash some word and then this is the channel. Mm -hmm. That's the link. So everybody can open a channel really with no, very, very easy. Exactly. Yeah. What I found in the last uh, few weeks, uh, because of the extra load, it's become a little less reliable than it was, uh, let's say, a month or two ago. Which up to then it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was pretty good. But I've, I've heard. Yeah, you several. can have your own server. That, that's a cool thing. So you can set up your own server, and if it's uh, strong enough, then. Um, for your own community or uh, association or whatever. And okay. that's totally up to you. Brilliant. Okay, thanks, uh, Sven. So, right, so Ram already had a question. And so maybe we'll try and answer his question first. And then whatever else, if anyone else has a subject that they would like to talk about um, or any other questions to, to the group, then yeah, just start start listing them up but yeah do you want to ask your question again ram and yeah, to summarize it again i'm um i'm just wondering like uh, rakesh what's your opinion also like all of you guys if it's uh, worthy to invest more money in buying organic seed or the conventional seed or like just the fruit that you buy from the local market would be enough like uh, in tenerife here in our community um, buying um, organic seed is about like 10 times more expensive than conventional one. So what's your thought about this? So first of all, it depends on the, the type of seeds that we're talking about. Me personally, I don't grow annuals, meaning that I don't need a continuous supply every year, year on, year out. You know, every year I don't have to keep buying seeds. Um, so I uh the, the reason why organic seeds uh why i would go for organic seeds over and above um conventional seeds is the uh well it, it depends on what kind of seeds you're getting but for example if you're getting um anything that's got f1 against it it means that it will not uh produce a true seed at the end so in other words you grow whatever your f1 plant is um you then allow it to maybe to go to seed but you put those seeds in the ground they will not germinate they will mm. not germinate because they're designed to be that way what they're, they're designed so that the more of the seeds uh so for every 100 seeds you've got they can more or less guarantee you know 80 90 percent of them will sprout and they will give you something uh, whereas older seeds, it could be a lot less. It depends on how they're stored, etc. So you'll get a much better germination rate, but you will not get a viable seed at the end of the year. So this is uh, for me. You know, this is Frankenstein stuff. This is um, so um, my so. Okay, you asked a question about getting like fruit seeds of fruits and things. So one thing when you're when you're planting trees in particular is you really need to understand cross pollination. Uh, so for example, apples, uh, the the seed that you get from an apple is a combination of the mother and the father. So in other words, the male and the female parts. So if a bee has gone or any other insect has gone to a pear tree and picked up some pollen and then come to your apple tree and then pollinated it, the fruit that's on the actual uh, tree stays, is, is dictated by the tree itself. So in other words, it will grow and it will still be whatever type of fruit is on your tree. But the seed that's inside there will be the combination of both the mother and father. So you plant that, you have no idea what you might end up with. Um, and this is why there's so many different varieties of things in the apple and the cucurbitia. There's many different plants that, that do that. So you really need to understand about cross-pollination. Uh, anything in the cucurbit family, uh, so pumpkins, cucumbers, uh, all, those, you know, all those kind of things, they cross-pollinate like crazy as well. So... Uh, 
just collecting seeds there's there's a, a real art to it you really need to know and understand so if it was a perennial me personally i i probably wouldn't as long as i know it's not um massively hybridized or genetically modified in any way i'd have no problems if um if i didn't have access to organic seeds i wouldn't have a problem going and taking you know if someone gave it to me i wouldn't buy it but if someone gave me some i would plant it knowing that after two three years it's acclimatized to my space and now that the, it is kind of organic in a way as long as it hasn't already been as say manipulated massively which if you look at it most carrots most uh, tomatoes and all these kind of things that people conventionally buy they've all been uh, selected they may not have been manipulated but many of them may have been manipulated carrots in particular the, the, the carrots only came about because of man cross pollinating things cross pollinating a carrot with a beetroot and so on and so forth until it, it became in that that's why the original carrots were black red purple uh through to white etc etc um it took quite a while before they came across the kind of orange conventional carrot um so yeah it, it's a difficult one to 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 really talk about so it really depends on what you want to grow my way of growing is i mostly rely on perennial plants and self-seeding plants anyway so i'm not reliant on seed companies i don't know does someone else want to speak into that maybe sophie or belinda or anyone else i could just uh add yeah like if you are like everything rakesh said already covering like perennial crops but if you are looking at annual crops the clearest thing is just to know that yeah anything that says f1 is a hybrid uh, they will actually, most things will grow if you keep the seed, but they won't be what you're expecting. So what you want to get is um, open pollinated heirloom varieties, which are usually older, hardier kind. And most of those, you'll be able easily to keep the seed. So even if it's an annual crop, you can keep your own seed. Or if it's a biannual crop on the second year, you'll keep your seed. And then you're going to have your own seed so from like i've had a lot of things i've bought once the seed from like more expensive organic seeds yeah or seed swaps and then after that you don't ever buy it because you've got your own seed and you can mm. keep extra and then you can swap from that so that's uh, fine and mm. one more thing just about like keeping seed like if you buy most things from a normal shop like you buy a tomato and you're like wow this is tasty i'll keep the seed you have to be aware that most of the things commercially grown and sold are all hybrids. So again, it's not worth keeping the seed from them. Only if you like eat something from someone's garden or from a farmer's market, is it likely to be open pollinated? Mm. That's a good point. Thank you, Sophie and Jakesh. Um, so like now we are going in the community in the discussion, like if we get some, organic seeds and non-organic seeds is there like a danger of they they cross pollinate and produce not so healthy plants like for seeding in the future like if we get if we get let's say some cucumber that's not organic and organic cucumber is it is there like a downside of planting both of them You just don't want to confuse uh, if it's open pollinated or hybrid and if it's organic. So organic is usually um, growing something without chemicals. So an organic seed literally means that it's been grown from a crop without chemicals. And also it hasn't been chemically treated, which is important if you want to do like microgreens or sprouting. But also if you want to put like seeds in your mouth to help them germinate and then plant them, you don't want it to be um, treated with chemicals. So that's organic. Um, and then the other thing is if it's hybrid or open pollinated. So once you've grown your own uh, seeds, if you haven't used chemicals, it's gonna be an organic seed. But what you want is to, if you want to breed something to type, then you want to keep uh, different cultures separate so you don't have a uh, crossing, which would change the quality of your seeds. 
So yeah. if you have organic seed, if you have like not organic carrot seed, which is open pollinated carrots, and you have organic carrot seed, which is um, open pollinated, um, they're both going to be the same once you've grown them and keep kept seeds from them. It's just mm. how that seed's been grown. So if you want to like get seed and then keep it for the future, the main thing you need to know is that it's open pollinated and not um, like an F1 hybrid seed. Okay. And then after one season of growing it organically, all of that seed you keep is organic seed. Um, but there are some good books about keeping your own seed. I can put also a link to one, which just explains about, you know, how you keep the seed, which things are easy to keep mm -hmm. and about keeping certain crops separate with like distance or with timing so that if you are keeping the seed, you get a true seed. Yeah, yeah that's there, cool. There's that a lot of, a lot of really important tricks of if you're saving seeds, uh, each seed is, is a slightly different. Um, in particular to stop cross pollination and stuff, you know, very often what people will do is they'll grow, uh, and in a non permaculture way, they will grow a big, huge amount of a certain thing in one plot. And then they'll only save the seeds from the very, very center because the chances are the, the pumpkin or the carrot or whatever it is in the center that's surrounded by hundreds of other things in the same variety the chances of it being cross-pollinated by something else. Um, actually, it's probably more uh, appropriate for uh, cucumbers and pumpkins and things. The chance of it being cross-pollinated by another species is a lot less. The other trick is to quite literally, when flowers come, is to put uh, a bag over it and stop anything else from pollinating it and then hand pollinate yourself. So yeah. there's lots of tricks if you want although go to yeah true to form what i can say is i've been keeping seed for about eight years and i don't bother to do any of those things because mm -hmm. i'm lazy and i don't want to grow a big field of one thing mm -hmm. and everything seems fine like everything that grows from our seed is tasty the pumpkins are still sweet the cucumbers are still juicy the kale is still green mm. so um, they keep, they keep their yeah they keep their kind like we have three different kinds of pumpkins we've been growing next to each other for like years and years and just keeping the seed and they're all still different so mm. i think yeah you can experiment like you're not gonna get like monsters after one year um the only thing that's important is keep your sweet peppers away from your chili peppers um if you if you don't want uh chili sweet peppers although the good thing is if you do keep them together you can get giant chili peppers which is exciting <laughs> <laughs> that's for me <laughs> great I, I don't see the problem with that i'm i'm failing to recognize the the reason why you're even telling us to to avoid that you well yeah chili. i <laughs> I was worried when someone first told me that you'd get like really tiny sweet chilies and I thought that would be terrible. But yeah, when I found out you can get like giant uh, chili peppers, it's pretty good. Yeah. Wow. That's Wonderful. interesting. Uh, I'm wondering, so like for now, like we want to make like a group decision about buying uh, non-organic seeds, just like from your experience, is it like, what's like the downside of, buying non-organic seeds from the shop if it's not available like from our neighbors um the downside of buying non-organic seeds are uh, you're supporting an industry that uses chemicals um in the first year you're maybe going to put some small residue of chemicals in your garden and maybe they're going to be less strong seeds because they've been grown in a system with chemicals and the plants are used to chemicals and when you grow them in your garden if you do it organically without chemicals uh, it might be hard for the plants to adapt but generally i've bought a lot of organic seeds and as long as they're open pollinated non-hybrid seeds it's okay is like get what you can that's affordable if you can get something that's local that's the most important because it's going to be adapted to your climate so if there are people producing seeds near to you or in a similar climate that's going to be the most successful yeah thank okay. you so Wonderful. much for your input guys right welcome so are there any other questions from anyone else 
or is there another subject anyone would like to raise? Well, with regards to uh, to seeds, I I'm just inter interested if uh, if you have kind of a resource uh, where good good links to buy seeds, good links to buy organic seeds. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in Denmark, but maybe it doesn't. If there's anything that sells uh, internationally, or if it if if we if there is like Facebook group for local farmers, like organic. Uh, yeah. permaculture farmer where we can swap seeds like that would be yeah. a good idea to search if it what's interesting you go to most of the seed companies online seed companies they are all totally inundated with people all of a sudden wanting to buy seeds from them that many of them uh basically you have you have to wait 10 15 minutes before they even you, before you even get a URL up, before you can even get a web page up, because they just cannot take the, the demand right now. So seeds are in, in short supply, all of a sudden people want to grow. Um, whereas if you're growing perennially, you know, you, you spend two, three years designing your system and getting it up and running. And then after that, you know, you, yeah, you don't really need to do much. And, um, you know, and, and whatever annuals you do, have in there you make sure that five ten percent of whatever it is you grow goes to seed for several reasons first of all from an environmental perspective you know in order to go to seed they have to flower in order when they go to flower they then attract all kinds of different amazing beautiful insects and, and what have you and so it creates life and that life creates more life uh, but then you also end up with more seeds as well many of which you can then just give away to your friends or keep for the next year or sprout or do whatever you, you want with them or keep, yeah, say keep them for the next year. So, um, so for me, the, you know, having at least uh, 60, 70, 80% of your, your, uh, your food coming from perennials uh, and then the other 20, 30, 40% from annuals means that A, you do a lot less work. Your soil doesn't need to be watered as much. You don't need to be adding nutrients, you don't need to be making composts, et cetera, et cetera. And so it just makes the system infinitely more productive and less reliant on having to go and buy seeds or having to find people to swap seeds out with. So that, that's my strategy. Um, so, yeah, any other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's one question around, um, let's turn the camera on. Um, there's one question around perennials for temperate climate. So do you have uh, some lists? So I know uh, Crawford has a lot uh, in his book, but do you have some list of good uh, yeah, perennials for the garden? So that was pretty much the first session that we did was on. Oh, that. okay, but okay. I can, I can forward you the, the, the yeah, what we what we discussed. Um, but yeah, Martin Crawford has an amazing, amazing, amazing book um, on perennial vegetables. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of good resources out there for perennial veg. Um, okay. But yeah, I can send you the list that I just popped up, which is. 90% of what I'm harvesting at the moment from my garden. Anyway. Cool. Thanks. So we've got 10 minutes left, nine minutes left before this session dies, and I think we should end it there. Uh, so we've got nine, 10 minutes. Is there any other subjects anyone would like to bring up or any other questions? So Kai's asking about uh, where to share slides. Sorry, I haven't really been keeping an eye on, um, on the messages. Uh, but if whatever slides and whatever websites and links, if we can just put them into the Facebook event, then everyone has access to them, if that's okay. Okay with everyone. Yeah. So, so people, and I'll put my list there as well. Cool. So any other, any other questions? So someone sent Belinda, I think, root cuttings and other types of cuttings work or like today I collected some shepherd's purse in seed, worried it would have 
dog puddle on it. So we'll just chuck the plants away. Blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, so, so taking cuttings, taking seeds, you know, uh, seeds from nature, that's 90% of what I do, to be honest, um, is when I see something interesting growing. So in, in London, we have a very, very specific type of rocket that's called London Rocket, which is just so powerful. Wow. Um, it's incredibly strong. You know, these seeds just come your way. They're, they're there if you learn to look for them. Um, you know, you can take cuttings and things from, yeah, almost anywhere. I don't throw the seeds away. I chuck them in the back garden, the whole plant, and then hope mm -hmm. that they'll just naturally grow in the, uh, you yep. know, yard, and then I won't have dog piddle on them. Exactly. Exactly. And so, I can not have to wash them. Yeah, yeah Plantago is one of my uh, probably most used herbs, plants, medicinally, and... Uh, and you know where you'll typically find plantago in the wild is where there's really compacted ground. So if I'm, I remember I was in Ventimiglia in Italy once. I had a really bad earache and I needed to find some plantago. So I just asked someone, "Is there a park nearby?" And someone pointed me in the direction of a park. Went there, looked at a kind of, you know, found somewhere where I could see that you know people were walking across the grass. And sure enough, bang, plantago. But um and earache gone within five minutes um but obviously relying on always picking up from a park it's not a clean it's not a nice environment luckily in this case it was for external you know just popping it in your ear i wasn't going to eat it um so things like that yes yeah, exactly as um belinda says you just get some seeds you scatter it around your garden bingo you know um so even if the plant itself is you know, from a dubious place, by the time you put it in your garden and it's grown, now you've got a clean source of, of that plant. So great. Okay, I see there's some other messages. Um, oh, the plant for the earache is plantago, um, plantain. Um, I can maybe type it in. Plantago, plantago major. So there's Plantago Major and Plantago Lancelota are the two most common ones. Uh, I both today in the uh, compacted ground, along with some, uh, the hawthorn is just coming into flower, so I'd pick some hawthorn mm -hmm. and some daisies, saponin rich for cough syrup. In fact, mm -hmm. I nearly lost my phone. I was sat on the ground picking daisies and plantain and some people came and asked what I was doing. And I said I was picking daisies to make cough mixture. And then luckily, the wife said, oh, is this yours? And picked up my phone, which had fallen out of my pocket. And I'd have never found it back in that field. Yeah. <laughs> I was so pleased. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bellis perennis is... is mm. uh, Bellis. Uh, people talk about echinacea, but from... Yeah. Um, you know, a herb, well, certainly from a homeopathic perspective, I'm a qualified homeopath, so I can speak more about that. Bellis perennis is even stronger than arnica, than echinacea, than uh, it has a really, 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 and it's, you know, it's it's so common. It's just everywhere. And, in people's um, Say again? In people's, in people's lawns. lawns. Yeah. In the lawn. Exactly. There, there's so much medicine out there um we just need to be aware of it um yeah plantago if there's, hay fever. If, say again it's amazing for hay fever mm -hmm. yep i, I mean, think i just cured roy's hay fever said he hasn't taken medicine for a week uh -huh. told him to drink an infusion of that yeah if there's one plant that you should all have in your gardens, I would say it's Plantago because it's, it's just so multifunctional. Uh, there's so many uses for it medicinally. Um, so not comfrey? Uh, comfrey from a medicinal perspective. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, if you've got broken bones, if you've got various other things, but there's also a lot of controversy about uh, how, 
yeah, you know, the, the, about how much you should even be eating, whether it's poisonous even. Uh, but yeah, but making poultices and stuff like that with plantago, fantastic. With um, marshmallow. Marshmallow yeah. and mallow, they're good to have in the garden as well. Hollyhocks. Yep. Yep, all those things in that. Uh, I don't actually know how you say that word. Mucilaginous, 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 whatever that word is. Uh, all the things in that kind of lady's finger, ooey, gooey kind of. And seaweed, seaweed. Seaweed. Okay. Maybe not so easy to grow in a garden, but. Um... <laughs> no, but on the beach, we're in Whitstable, we've got the beach. Uh, brilliant. So, yeah, so, so, yeah, there's so many medicinal things out there um yeah we just need to to learn about them uh but yeah comfrey the the main reason why i have most permaculturists who will have comfrey in the garden is because of its ability to accumulate minerals and nutrients um especially uh potassium uh, it also uh it mines potassium uh it also mines and holds on to a lot of nitrogen as well it's not a nitrogen fixer though uh, which many people try to say is, uh, but it does. So it, it's a really magical one to have in the garden uh, for various reasons. Okay, so we've got a minute left, so I think maybe it's time just to say thank you all very much. And um, yeah, I hope this was useful. Um, it's very useful. Thank you so much. We can. Yeah, thank um, you. I'm for, well, I'm, I'm about to start doing a teacher training course online. Um, so I'm not sure I'm going to have much more time to do stuff like this. We've also got, we started to do a, like a 10 session uh, introduction to permaculture gardening. So how to make a, a really quick uh, permaculture garden. So if anyone's interested in that, we're going to start maybe finding some dates in the next few weeks. Um, so basically, at the end of it, you'll you'll have designed your own garden. Um, that, that's the, the purpose of that that session. And for those who are part of the Roots and Permaculture Network, remember we've got a learning day tomorrow, which is like a, a five-hour version of this, uh, where we have all kinds of stuff that we share over over the thirty forty minute sessions. So those who are part of the Roots and Permaculture Network, we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Otherwise, um, yeah, lots of love to everyone. And um, yeah, just um, if you've got any other resources and skill, any things, just keep posting it on, on the Facebook. Uh, yeah, Facebook promo. So see Thank you there. Guys. Lots of love. Big